I was really glad to receive this invitation because I am also a printmaker. And in fact, the things that make me good at printmaking is what makes me good at biotechnology as well. So I had a really shared interest in coming here as I see that Center 3 is reimagining itself and it's putting itself within a larger context of reproductive technologies in, as a way of understanding printmaking and its value and its place in our culture and society today. So my job at the University of Windsor, I was hired as the printmaking professor. Now, of course, when I showed up for the job interview, I said to them, you know I'm going to build a lab. And they went for it. But aside from that, I manage a printmaking studio at the University of Windsor. Our emphasis is on Intaglio. Since I arrived, I also built for them a digital print lab, where we now do large and small scale um, inkjet printing, as well as we have a really wonderful oversized scanning unit. But the thing that excites me the most and that relates to these other things and the, th the new thing that I've brought to the University of Windsor is the Incubator Lab. It's called Incubator Hybrid Laboratory at the Intersection of Art, Science and Ecology. And this lab is a research lab where I conduct my own research. I also have a variety of graduate students who come to the University of Windsor to do projects there. But I also run a class, an undergraduate class called BioArt, Contemporary Art and the Life Sciences. And this class allows students who are non-specialists, um, students from both visual arts but across the university, to take some of their first classes that allow them to have access to biotechnological protocols, and then towards the produc production of creative artworks using those protocols. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an understanding about how I see the connection between analog, digital, and biological forms of reproduction and possibly the role that we now play as artists working with biotechnology is very similar to the role that artists may have historically taken on working with analog forms of reproduction or digital technology that we're engaging with today. So um, this is my slide for analog reproduction. I like to remind people that printmaking is still in great use, that it is the origin of currency, um, forms of identification, and also the sort of models that come from printmaking really allowed for the production models that we're able to use today in contemporary manufacturing. Um, so if we think back to the origin of analog forms of reproduction, it was a real transformation in our technological environment as a society and as a culture. And it had a lot of trickle-down effects aside from just the technology in terms of the production of mass culture, um, forms of mass production, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that quite often we see a real link in the history that we tell ourselves between analog or print-based reproduction and digital forms of reproduction and the sort of exponential, again, transformation of our society and our relationships to one another based on those forms of reproduction. But I think that we don't always consider biological reproduction as another level or another form of that type of production. And I conceive of it as a, um, a technology that involves a variety of reproductive skills, very similar to some of the skills that we use in the other fields, but also conceptually as a, a new framework that we're using to reimagine ourselves and our society and our culture, our bodies, our relationships to one another. And so if we trace the sort of historical trajectory that a lot of people do between analog into digital forms of reproduction, I think that we can also use those same systems of understanding to understand how biotechnology may affect us in the future and how it's affecting us today. So I'll give you an example, and we're going to start with Baudrillard. I am a professor, so I don't mind a little theory. Um, so he says here that the three orders of appearance, and this is from simulations, parallel to the mutations of the law of value have followed one another since the Renaissance. Counterfeit is the dominant scheme of the classical period from the Renaissance to the Industrial Revolution. Production is the dominant theme in the Industrial Era. Simulation is the reigning scheme of the current phase that is controlled by code. But I would argue that we are moving into a biological form of reproduction, actual reproduction or post-biological reproduction, where rather than producing or reproducing or simulating new environments, new ecologies, new bodies, we are in fact growing or producing new environments and new bodies using the biotechnology to affect, in a very literal, real embodied sense, ourselves and the ecology that we live in. So this is a really linear schematic that helps me to 
imagine what are the relationships between these forms of production. Um, I made a slide on reproduction and it, had, it was like sort of sexy. There were people in, and things happening, but I, I took that out. Um, and then, <laughs> so I think of that as one of, you know, maybe like nature's reproduction. Um, but mo I, well, one thing I'd like to say about this is that even though this model is linear and it really helps me to sort of organize information and helps me to communicate to my students the relationship that I see between biotechnology and earlier forms of reproduction, I think that if we were really going to do this properly, it would look a lot more like this. And what I mean by that is that all of these things are sort of happening simultaneously in multiple orders and ways in relationship to one another. And that this schema is a story that we need to tell ourselves to understand what's going on around us, but it's actually a lot messier than that. So I'm going to talk, tell you the story that I tell my students in printmaking and that a lot of printmakers tell ourselves about our technology. Um, and again, like I said, it's not literally true, but it's a schema. It's a way to imagine it. And then I'm going to think about that and apply it to maybe how we need to apply some of the same systems of analysis to biotechnology. So I love this quote. It says, the West treasures few moments in its history, the way it treasures the story of the democratization of print. And I think that there's a few ways that we can read that. First of all, the West likes to tell its story about printmaking and the history and role of printmaking. But I think that if we look to the East, who were making prints long before people in the West were, that it kind of screws up the story. So we don't often talk about Japan and woodblock printing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that the other thing that this sort of does for me is it talks to me about how we need to create these sort of schemas to understand how technologies have transformed our lives. And this can be a really useful story. So it usually starts with the Vatican. Historically, um, before printmaking or reproductive technologies, if you wanted information, you had to go to the center to receive the information. So rather than information moving out through the world in a mediated environment towards you, you had to physically go to it and receive it one-on-one, -on -one, firsthand. And then, you know, we had things like pilgrimages that accomplished that. And that, that information, as it would then sort of disperse back into the world, would be like really an elaborate game of telephone, where information would be sort of transformed by various orders of storytelling as it moved through the world. And when we to look at the earliest forms of reproduction that were going on at that time, we look at things like the illuminated manuscripts, which also were a very elaborate form of the telephone game. You know, imagine a monk locked up in a monastery for three years, copying a single text, who um, gets bored or has poor eyesight or doesn't like page 32, and changes the story as it goes along. This is a very slow and inefficient form of reproduction. But then, aha, alas, you have the introduction of the printing press. And what it does is it shifts our ability to produce information. Um, books that would have normally taken three years to copy and maybe move on, you know, you could make a copy and take it over to the next monastery, um, were able to be reproduced within, you know, hundreds of copies within a, an equivalent amount of time. And what happens with that form of reproduction is a shift away from an oral culture towards a literate culture, but also a shift away from people having to move towards information and instead being able to receive it as it comes through their lives. And printmakers like to take responsibility for the Protestant Reformation by suggesting that uh, Martin Luther would not have been as popular in his 95 theses on the powers of indulgences had they not been reproduced in printmaking form. So in terms of the thinking about how print has transformed our lives and how it still plays an enormous role in our culture and society today, I like to identify for people a lot of contemporary instances of printmaking that are still really vital and utilized. I love to mention currency. Anyone who has an MFA in printmaking in Canada is on the CSIS list as a possible counterfeiter. I like to think about per forms of personal identification, also something that can be counterfeited. Um, but also a lot of sort of print and magazine and sort of other sort of public um, interfaces in the world that are, are generated through historical print technologies and craft dinner cheese boxes. 
Um, print also has a powerful tradition of um, political transformation that as soon as people realized the power of the reproduced image, they really realized that they could harness that power and reproduce it in ways that maybe were anti-authoritarian. And I'd like to point out that one of my favorite scenes in The Pianist, when um, the Jewish population is taken into sort of internment, um, there's a lovely family who arrives and they sort of have heavy things in their pants and all of a sudden all these pieces and gears and equipment start falling out of their pants and their pockets and the, the boy pulls something out of his shirt and Papa puts it all together and they have a mimeograph. And it's the first form of resistance within the terms of the Jewish internment is to print flyers and distribute information that is counterproductive to the environment that they're living in. Printmaking is probably also responsible for a lot of the bureaucracy that we suffer. Sorry about that. I work at a university, it's totally the story of my life. Um, so when I think about printmaking or when I think about how we think about technological transformations, um, the technology itself transforms production models. It pr transforms how we produce the world, the very world that we live in. When I think about printmaking and analog forms of reproduction, I think a lot about assembly lines. If we could, uh, try to imagine other forms of um, production models that came out of the digital era, we can really look at sort of like more nodular, networked, non-decentralized visions of production. But what I really want to talk to you about today is the post-biological production models, and really about using the very biology itself to reproduce itself in ways that are not, that are transformed towards human ends. And I think that when we look back at the introduction of printmaking in society, you know, I often tell my printmaking students that, that the book was like the internet, it changed everything. And I think that we're going to suffer or enjoy an even further, deeper, intrinsic transformation in our society, in our bodies, and in our very ecology, in a generational sense, through these types of production technologies. That when we produce, a, 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 when we reproduce in a biological sense, those organisms can go on and on and on to have as many babies as they like. It gets really far out of our control. Uh, and I think it's something we need to be really aware of. And I think that as artists and as hackers and as sort of like, you know, fringe um, participants in society, that we need to really um, arm ourselves with knowledge and experience and create a voice for questions about where do we want these technologies to take us as a culture. So again, if we look here at some of the metaphors generated by these three forms of reproduction, and I would like to remind you that this is a very didactic model and very linear, I think that we can really see a shift away, a shift where we're starting to imagine the body through these metaphors. In a way, it allows us as a society and a culture to imagine ourselves and how our bodies might work, but we're really moving into a point now where rather than imagining ourselves through the post-biological, we're actually producing ourselves in a really embodied, lived sense. And I also should mention at this point that the images to support that don't really exist yet. These types of images are very old now, and they're images we understand. The only images I could find to reimagine that were digital. We haven't... Whenever I find images of um, genetically modified organisms, they look you know, fairly similar or innocuous or not measurably post-biological. So I think that as a culture, we can, we're still, and as artists, we're still at a position where we can really affect the visual metaphors that we use to understand biotechnology as a culture, as humanity. So I think that what I want to say is that in terms of this new form of reproduction, I think the transformation will be as profound as these other forms of reproduction as they move through our culture. But I think that in a, in a, in a very real sense that we need to understand that, that tr those transformations are not just metaphorical, that we will actually literally transform our bodies, our societies, and our ecologies with these technologies. And so I think it's imperative that we sort of together participate in that transformation um, rather than allow it to happen towards sort of corporate ends um, as it may be. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about bioart. Bioart is a form of art production that uses biology. Bioart can be described as genetic art, transgenic art, biotech art, vivo arts, life art, li live art, life art, ecological art, land art, eco art, and by some definitions, performance art and body art have been repurposed as bioart. 
There's a lot of conflicting opinions about what bioart is because it's still pretty new. Um, some people see that bioart is a field of production where the artistic media is life or living systems. Some people think bioart is art that utilizes the tools of the biological sciences in the production of artworks. And some people imagine it as a field of art that explores the parameters of life in the production of art. I'm probably farthest towards the latter. But the one thing I'd really like to say, and Jens Hauser is probably the sort of key art historian who, and curator in the field, and he really draws a really uh, interesting point to our attention, and he says that not only is the term bioart or the definition of bioart mutating and, and, and changing through time, but its object uh, of classification is also growing, living, and dying, and subject to a life cycle. So his argument is that the term bioart will always escape us because what it's attempting to describe is constantly in a state of flux and sometimes no longer. But there are some ideas about what bioart is not. Bioart is not art that represents life. Um, chromosomes, DNA, etc. Computer simulations of genetic processes, evolution, plant growth, etc. are simulations of a life and not alive and hence not bioart. That would be George Gessert. Jens Hauser would say biofictional manifestations such as, such as chimera sculptures, DNA portraits, chromosome paintings, or mutant depicting digital photo tricks are no more examples of bioart than Claude Monet's impressionistic paintings would be classified as water lily art or cathedral art. So there's a lot of sort of argument and the conferences get quite heated, it's a lot of fun. Um, about what bioart is not. And some people say bioart is not artificial life. Some people say bioart is not documentation of bioart, which is kind of complicated because most bioart lives in labs. A lot of people argue that bioart is not body art, food art, or ecological art. But there is one thing that I know for sure, and bioart is not science. And I don't mean that it doesn't use the tools of science, and sometimes it looks like science, but science is a really clear methodology. It's an objective methodology. Um, and bioart has nothing to do with that. So the idea of creating um, reproducible results, data, measurable outcomes, is of no significance whatsoever in bioart. Very similar to the last talk, if it's cool, we're usually pretty okay with it. I will say one thing in particular, though, that from my perspective, an, an essential truth of bioart is that it's political. And I think that regardless of the content of the work, whether or not the artist is really thinking about that as part of their production, that when artists tinker with life towards aesthetic ends, when artists take on the role of the authoritarian scientist in our culture, and together, you know, hands-on work in the manipulation of life, that that is an intrinsically political act. And all of us can look to you know, the results of Steve Kurtz and his very unfortunate run-in with the FBI as a clear instance, an example, that there's not, there are some people who would prefer artists to stay out of the lab and away from biotechnology, which makes me want to do it more. George Gessert is probably, he's considered the grandfather of bioart. He genetically um, breeds irises towards um, negative traits, all the traits that the iris um, growing community hates. And then he takes them to their festivals and shows them and they're all like, oh, because this is such an ugly iris according to all the criteria of what makes a good iris in the botanical environment. He says here, do artists cross the line when they breed plants or animals or use the tools of biotechnology? Scientists ru routinely cross the line. So do farmers, business people, military men, and doctors. Only artists and certain religious people hesitate. Of course, one of the great human dilemmas is that we do not know the extent of our powers. We invent outrageously and as casually as we breathe, but we have no idea where our inventions will take us. Extinction, slavery, a thousand years in Disneyland. Even if the Holocaust had never happened, we would have good reason to worry about where knowledge of genetics and DNA will take us. We will need all of the awareness we can muster to engage evolution. To the extent that art favors awareness, the more artists who cross the line, the better. So bioart, unlike these other forms of reproduction we discussed earlier, and one of the reasons why I'm really attracted to sort of for figuring it out, intrinsically involves an ethical consideration not afforded to other life forms. Because when you lift, manipulate life towards aesthetic ends, 
there is intrinsically a bioethical component that needs to be considered regardless of the content of the work. Now, retroactively, this has also reminded me that every time I make something on my iPhone or with an intaglio press, I'm also engaging with a complex intersection of a variety of ethics, but ones that maybe don't present themselves to us as forcibly and as immediately as when we're working with life forms. So what I want to talk to you about today is my lab. Um, I've traveled all around the world. I've been making bioart for almost 10 years now. And I was really tired of living out of a suitcase. I was really tired of doing bioart projects that could only last two or three or six months. Because life is really slow and sometimes it takes three years to grow a really great ant colony. And the last thing is I was really sort of growing tired of working in environments that were built for scientists. I am one of the bioartists who really works a lot with biotechnological protocols. I really need access to a lot of expensive equipment in a sterile environment. And when I was doing that in labs that were designated for cancer research, the cancer always won. So I built my own lab so I could do things in there that would not disrupt cancer-based research, allow that to go on because it's very important, but then allow me to do things in my space that would be completely inappropriate in those environments. And so I got a job at the University of Windsor as the printmaking professor, and I built in the old papermaking studio a lab. It's called Incubator Hybrid Laboratory at the intersection of art, science, and ecology. So this lab suits, serves a variety of functions. It's a studio and a lab to fill a facilitate my research as well as research from a variety of graduate students and, student, and undergraduate students. It's an educational facility for the BioArt class. It's an exhibition venue so we can host, we're a certified lab, so we can host living artworks in there that you would not be allowed to see in a gallery. So sometimes we have private viewings. It's also an art installation. I'm really interested in challenging contemporary laboratory aesthetics and the authority of the sort of lab design. Um, and lastly, it's, it served as the home base for a portable laboratory that I took to the BAMP Center for the Arts in 2011 and that I continue to parade around the world today. So this is my lab. It's very nice, friendly, warm. Uh, this is our sterile hood. When you're working in a, uh, with a lot of these protocols, you need a really, really clean environment. Um, and so what we did is we, re we built from scratch this um, sterile work environment that has a HEPA filter put into the back here. And what we do is we pump air through there. And when you're working in there, you can, um, the air will become sterilized as it comes through the HEPA filter. Now, we could choose to spend $9,000 on getting like a cancer-grade um, sterile work environment, or we could spend $1,500 on making a very snazzy homemade work version, which as of yet has not produced any contamination. None of our projects have been contaminated. It's been a sterile environment. And then we also have a lot of microscopes and imaging equipment there, because artists like to take pictures. These are my students. They are a very enthusiastic bunch. Um, one of the things I really like about working at the University of Windsor is that the students are unjaded. They're not worried about not being cool, and they're really happy to roll up their sleeves and try something new. So even though a lot of these people have had absolutely no scientific experience whatsoever, they're really game to be goofy and to try something new and to make lots of mistakes. Um, and so, so far, I think it's been really successful. And previously, having taught in a lot of other universities, you know, a lot of students are really concerned about whether or not this is really art, or will their hair get messed up by the equipment. And that really doesn't seem to be a problem at Windsor, and it makes me very happy. Um, while we're there, we do a lot of things with the lab. So this is, um, some of my projects overlap with the, the work I do with my students. So this is called um, Inside Out Laboratory Ecologies. And I do a lot of things where I build labs in like camping aesthetic environments. And I really like the metaphor of camping and outdoor um, sort of ecological interspecies interactions to describe biotechnology. So my students sort of contribute and help me test a lot of pieces before I take them out into the public sphere. I also teach them hydroponics. I tell them that when they graduate, this could be an alternative career choice <laughs> if the art thing doesn't work out for them. Um, we do do some like pretty high-end science stuff as well. Here we're doing a genetic transformation of bacteria. So we're inserting a P-GLO gene, which is a phosphor um, phosphorescing gene from a jellyfish, into the bacteria in the lab. And the students get very serious. And uh, so far, it's been pretty successful. Again, no contamination, which makes me very happy. 
Uh, and then we also bring a lot of artists in. So last week we had Suzanne Ankerin from New York. This is uh, Paul Venus, who we had up from Buffalo. And here he taught us how to do gel electrophoresis. And gel electrophoresis is the technology that they use in CSI when they're matching DNA. Um, you know, then they hold it up and they go, we have a match. Um, well, <laughs> As it turns out, it's really easy to reverse engineer that technology, and I could make any of you match the murderer. So um, Paul Venus showed up, and he showed us how to generate um, copyright signs and happy faces using gel electrophoresis as a means of sort of identifying that as, as a programmable technology. And then my students do a lot of really interesting projects. This is uh, Marcy Bowles, and her grandfather is a taxidermist. And she spent a semester wandering around Windsor finding dead birds and collaborating with her grandfather on a taxidermy project. This is Jessica Howick, who's actually now at Emily Carr doing her master's degree. And she is a genetically identical twin. And the two of them designed an interpretive dance called the cloning dance. And they convinced a scientist on main campus to allow them to do the dance in the lab while the graduate students were cloning DNA. And this is Tokyo Webster. And this is actually a printmaking project. Uh, she uh, was my assistant for a number of years. And what she did is she did lino cuts of Betty and Veronica and then of some monsters and she printed them using um, bacteria. So she would take the lino cut and impress it into a dish of bacteria and then impress it into a clean dish of agar and within 24 hours the, the image would grow, a, a living image in the agar. And this is Amanda White. She just graduated from our MFA program. Now I must say she calls this prog project frugivore but we call this project poop tomatoes. And the reason for that is, is that she decided that she wanted to reactivate the um, relationship, the interspecies relationship that we normally have with seeds and fruits as mammals. So she went to the grocery store and she bought a beautiful container of heirloom tomatoes and then she ate them all. The next day she collected her poop and she planted it and grew three generations of beautiful heirloom tomatoes. And she continues to eat the tomatoes and collect the poop and grow them again and again. And this is her thesis show down here at the bottom. And she's done these beautiful anatomical drawings of the seeds moving through her digestive system and growing in the poop. She's going on to do her PhD shortly. So we have a lot of fun in our lab. Um, we also do a lot of field trips. I really, I like to expose the Windsor students um, to um, sort of a more international vision of what art, the art life can be like. So I take them with me a lot, which is one of the reasons why I brought Casey with me today. Um, so this is a workshop that we did with Stellark at, um, called the Bioremediation Workshop at Flex Media in Concordia University. A bunch of us took the train over to Montreal and um, did a variety of biotechnological protocols, pro did prototypes for Stellark, and then we did a project hosted by my lab where we took, called Cell Break, where we took a bunch of specimens for the lab on a day hike. Because we felt that they were kind of entrapped and ensnared in the laboratory environment, and it wasn't very friendly, and there was no good view, so we decided to take them out for a view on top of Montreal Mountain. We do a lot of exhibitions out of the lab. We've done a couple down at LaBelle. This is our most recent, just last month, um, called Art and Life. And a number of the artists from this show are going to be in an exhibition at the Ontario Science Museum next fall, highlighting the efforts of the lab. And then we also do a lot of sort of kooky outreach stuff. Like not all of it's heavy in the tech. Sometimes I like to play with the metaphors. So this is the art and ecology sidewalk parade that we did through Windsor um, last month. And they were having sort of a street festival in our downtown neighborhood called Walkerville. And we proposed to do a parade for them. What they didn't know is that the people who showed up for the parade were in the parade. And so we had a variety of artists and different bio art and art and ecology projects, but anyone who showed up as a spectator, we gave them a job and a noisemaker and put them in a lab coat and we made them parade through the streets of Windsor. It was very noisy. And we called out and cheered for all of the different organisms that we share our local ecology with. So for example, I screamed things on my megaphone like, let's hear it for bacteria. And then they'd all scream, yay, bacteria. And people came out into the streets and asked us what we were doing. And we invited them to the lab. So I'm really interested in sort of engaging with the real local environment in Windsor. So, 
The students in my, in my environment get a lot of access to direct technology skills, all the way from printing to digital to um, biotechnology. And I really like to allow for crossover between those three areas. We sort of like reverse engineer a lot of those technologies to do things they're not really supposed to do. But I'm also really interested in teaching them indirect technology skills, and that essentially is more of a hacker mentality. Really thinking about engaging in a curious relationship with technology, being more interested in the spectrum of technologies from the very old to the very new, um, and allowing themselves to sort of work at home um, and using technologies for things they weren't originally intended for. Um, in terms of old and medium technologies, like for example, um, one of the things I really like to do in my lab is every year we do a food project where we use one of the oldest forms of biotechnology. This year we made cheese, um, but last year we used yeast and we made beer. And so that sort of disrupts that, that, that image that I gave you that biotechnology is the most urgent new technology available to us. Actually, it's also one of the very oldest technologies known to mankind. I encourage them to do a lot of projects at home. I get in trouble with their parents sometimes. And I encourage them to use technologies for things that they were not originally intended for. I like to talk to them a lot about the illusion of choice that we have in our more consumer culture relationship to technology, where the big question is, what color iPod are you going to get? Instead of, do you really need an iPod? What is it for? Couldn't you try a megaphone? And I like to really encourage sort of a more tinkering, backyard relationship with technology. So the Incubator Lab, we do a lot of stuff and we have a lot of fun. If anyone wants to come for a visit sometime, you may. I will tell you that we are also doing a workshop tomorrow called Windsor Hamilton Yeast, where we are gonna cultivate some of the microbes from your city and we're gonna let them uh, co-cultivate with some of the microbes from our city and we're gonna see what happens there. And the last thing I'd like to say is that um, I'm really fortunate to be at the University of Windsor because they're experiencing a transformation. And we've amalgamated a whole bunch of departments, brought together a whole bunch of non-artists to make a new department. And I think it's called the Center for Arts and Creative Innovation, but they keep changing the name. Um, and within this environment, the incubator lab is going to get a new facility. Our current facility is a BSL level one, which means there's no known harm to humans. But our new environment is going to be right in the main lobby of the new um, armory building. It's gonna have a glass wall that creates a vitrine performance space. It's gonna have theatrical lighting. It's going to have speakers so that we can do performances on the inside and people on the outside can hear us. But most importantly, it's gonna be rated BSL level two, which means I can use carcinogens, pathogens, and human byproducts in my lab. So that is very exciting. It'll be one of the only BSL level two labs in the world for artists. So that is an introduction to my lab. And what I'd like to do is I brought with me Casey Ofrey, who is one of my best students and whose work really typifies this relationship between biology and printmaking that I was talking about. And I wanted Casey to come and tell you about her work. So well, I first started off doing uh, printmaking um, Intaglio print and uh, I was really in Windsor there was foxes coming around our house and I was really interested in what was going on and the fact that nobody knew that the foxes in Windsor were catching mange and they were dying because mange eats away at the flesh. So I wanted to do a print that would show the decay of, an, of the fox but I wanted to use the same copper plate instead of using multiple plates. So this is the first one I did, and this is the, which would be the last stage, just the uh, skeleton. And then I started, I started burnishing some areas out and adding some to kind of bring like the second stage where he's kind of um, decomposing, but he's not really still kind of there. And then the final one I did was his full face, which was kind of interesting because you got to see all the different lines and I didn't really know if this would be part of bio art or anything until I spoke with uh, Dr. Willett and she mentioned, oh yeah, this is totally bio art. And she would, so I started researching more and then I started just having fun in my um, advanced printmaking class. And so I made him into a fox man. So this was a full sheet of copper that I purchased and it was probably um, at the store at the university. So it was probably about um, maybe three feet 
long and maybe about two feet wide and so I just had fun with making him and then I wanted to mix um, intaglio with digital so I scanned a whole bunch of steak and I scanned some uh, deer fur and um, some some bones that I had from a taxidermist that I met and this was the second stage that I did but I wanted to print new t the new digital print with um, the old intaglio print and then I started going into bio art and when I was doing this I really thought it was interesting that um, some people that work in labs don't really care don't really know what's going on with the animals so I put myself in a very tiny cage and I had my lab tech come in every half an hour and give me a bottle of water and make me drink it and then she would just leave and I was in there for about two and a half hours and I wanted to test how much water it would take for me, excuse me, for me to urinate. So I peed in the cage twice and I laid in it for about two and a half hours until the class came in and it was a performance piece I did for our bio art class, which turned out really interesting, but it was really painful and sore and uh, it smelled bad, excuse me, and it smelled really bad. So I probably won't do that ever again. And then um, I met this gentleman named Dom, and this is his place. And he, uh, instead of a taxidermist, what he does is he collects um, deer or foxes or bears, whatever any hunters hunt, and he cleans the meat off the bone, like right here, and then he gives it to these beetles that eat the flesh, and then he gives the bones back to the person who owns them. And either they'll be um, an, like the natural, so you kind of get some dark marks, or if they want it bleached, which I believe the one up in that corner is right there, it's bleached, so it's pure white, and it's very beautiful. And the work that he does, it ends up, um, it's very, it's not only just beautiful, but it kind of gives um, the animal, not just like, oh, well, we hunted it and then we just got rid of it. It kind of gives it another stance that this is something important or it's important to the hunter. So I thought, why not dressing up as a 50s housewife and why don't I clean a fox skull? So I learned how to clean the fox skull and prep it. And this is another one that I started to learn how to clean. I salted it. This is a deer hide and I started, um, I learned how to clean it to prepare it because I wanted to learn how to print on the hide. I was really interested in the fact of using intaglio and maybe etching into it and printing on the hide. But then I also ended up getting this beautiful face of this bear from Dom and this is before it was salted and I wore it because I wanted I've, I've always been interested in that feeling or that connection that people could have with the animal and I wanted to see how close I could get to the animal so I p posed with the bear hide over my face in different positions but this is one I brought in and I and it was weird because I felt sad and I felt weird having this other animal's skin on me and I didn't you couldn't tell that I was sad while I was posing but he the bear's face looked sad and I thought that that was really interesting and then I wanted to my plan is to prep the the bear hide so after I was done doing this I put I salted it and now it's um, kind of uh, preserving the hide and I plan on cleaning all the extra flesh from the inside off and I plan on printing the bear's skull on a plate on a copper plate and then running the bear face with the plate through the press to show that um, shadow of what was once there is not there anymore so when i was still in jennifer or dr willett's bio art class i ended up doing little test prints with a deer hide and i did some um, aquatint aquatint which is where at the university of windsor what we do is we spray um, a spray like spray paint onto the copper plate and then we can put that in the acid and where the acid um, can eat through wherever it sees the copper and where the spray paint isn't there then it won't eat to that it won't eat the plate and then I inked it and then I ran them each through three of them I did the um, aquatint and then three of them I just did line work and the line work turned out a lot better than the aquatint the aquatint didn't look great 
And then this is a close-up of them. So these are just test ones. I didn't really want to print on a full hide of an animal just to test it. I didn't feel whenever I get any hide from um, a taxidermist or from Dom, I don't just want to use it because I got it. I feel like if I'm going to print something on this, it has to be somewhat meaningful or has to have some reasoning behind it. I'm not just going to waste the hide. So these are just little tiny. They're probably about that big little test plates. So yeah, is that good?